using that as a, a song for uh, a precursor to our message this morning. And once again, as we've done before, we like to just share the main points of our message. And I'll mute myself. It sounds like there's a bit of an echo here. Let's see what we've got. That'll move along. This is from the previous week. Okay, there we go. I think that'll take care of it right there. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, when I spoke with Peter uh, some time ago about what series I was going to give, I had mentioned to him, Has, have you heard messages on Jonah? And he said, no, not for a long time. I said to myself, Indeed, I have not heard him for a very long time. I think it was years and years ago. I think I heard a series by Warren Wearsby. That name is probably familiar with some of you. And that has to be 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago I heard on the radio. And I was thinking through this series of messages. And I won't say, as I said before, I got the inspiration from a news headline in the area. That was just the confirmation I needed when I heard about whales showing up at Spring Lake so close to Belmar. And then somewhere along the line in this area, a whale swallowed two swimmers and spit them right back out again. So they didn't swallow them all the way down, but he spit them back out again. I said, okay, well, that's confirmation for this series of messages. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's why you're getting us, uh, the message here. The Lord spoke to me initially, and that was the confirmation I suppose I needed to get. But anyway, if you are visitors, a uh, visitor here with us uh, today and haven't been on these messages, I know that you can get them on the website uh, for Fifth Avenue Chapel. Uh, we've already looked at chapters one and two. Today we'll be looking at chapter three. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to chapter three of the book of Jonah. And as you're turning, I want to mention we had a delightful time with the Academy of Arts program who did the Pilgrim's Progress. It was great to see that. We had that at our chapel on Thursday night. The place was packed, both sides of the pew, front and back, side to side, packed with people from various places. And then once again, uh, the following night at Ocean Grove, we had the opportunity to see it twice. And, uh, you know, we, we miss, for me, when I hear something twice, I'm listening to it the second time, I catch things I didn't catch the first time. So it's really, uh, it was really a worthwhile endeavor to do that twice. But if you ever have the opportunity, let me just uh, make that recommendation, take advantage of that. Really fine group of about 14 young people ranging from age 15 to 18, just tremendous. And to hear them use their time and talents for the Lord is just a really wonderful thing to behold. So uh, if you ever had that opportunity, I wanna recommend that uh, heartily to you. So we're looking at the life and ministry, if you will, of Jonah the prophet. And we mentioned from a portion in 2 Kings uh, that Jonah was a young prophet who, who prophesied prosperity for the nation of Israel, and that prophecy came true. And so as a young man, a young prophet for the Lord, he was mightily used of God in the ministry to the nation of Israel. And so he had a very, perhaps a very popular uh, beginning in his ministry. And yet, if you were just to look at the reading here in the book of Jonah, you get the idea that this guy's got a real problem. And he does have a problem in this juncture of his life. But it's a reminder to you and to me that even though we may have done some great things for the Lord previously, we always have to be on our guard, don't we? To make sure that we are keeping our heart with all diligence, as Solomon said in the book of Proverbs. That we make sure that we guard the heart for out of it are the issues of life. And so none of us are exempt from taking a wrong step, making a left turn, if you will, in our walk in ministry of the Lord, despite the fact that God may have used us in a wonderful way. We experience his blessings and his favor, perhaps at some juncture in our lives. And yet, as we go along the way, uh, that we make some compromises that we really don't want to do. And Jonah is an example of that. But now in this chapter, chapter three, we see the recommissioning of Jonah. So God is going to restore his prophet back to useful service once again. And it's a great reminder of the mercy and grace of God toward his people. So if you have ever experienced some disappointment or some failure in your life as a believer, don't give up on yourself. Think of all the different people that God has restored in the scriptures 
and uh, he can restore you to the useful service for him. So let's take a look here at Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. We read there, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in the ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And once again, God will bless the reading and obedience of his word. Well, in this chapter, we have the example of the preaching prophet. We mentioned in the first chapter, he is the reluctant prophet, the running prophet. And then secondly, he in the second chapter, he is the praying prophet as he prays in the belly of the great fish. So many different lessons that come out of the life and ministry of Jonah the prophet, very practical for you and me. One I think about in chapter two is that here was Jonah who obviously had read scripture, the very same scripture that you hold in your hands. He read the book of Psalms and committed to memory. So just think about this. Here is Jonah, right? He is in the belly of the great fish, had a smell down in that belly, okay? With uh, digestive juices going, uh, you know, against uh, Jonah and dark. It's not like he sat there with a lamp on and did study at night or anything like that, right? He is in a dark place and yet he's able to commit, uh, able to recite scripture that he committed to memory. It's a great reminder to you and to me that we need to study the word of God and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. But even if we do hide in our, our hearts like Jonah did, he still sinned. So we need to be keeping guard of our hearts. And so here in chapter three is the portion where he is now going back to Nineveh, recommissioned, restored after all that experience that happened in chapters one and chapter two. Jonah was a person that God had a hard time dealing with. And Perhaps God uh, had a harder time dealing with Jonah than he did with the mariners because the mariners rode hard to try to bring that boat to land and they were yielded to what God had in store. And so they called out and they sacrificed to God. Someone has said God sometimes has a harder time with his people than he does with the people outside. You know, and that's the case. I've seen that in my own experience. Talk to some people. Now, there are going to be hardened, what people call gospel hardened people who you know, are enemies of the Lord. That's a different class of people. <clears throat> but for the most part, when you talk to people about God, the general citizen out there, some of the other times they're not so much against the things of God. We might think they are because they don't go to church. They don't do the things that we do. And right away, we think they're the enemies of the Lord. And they may not be at all. They may be very soft and sensitive to the things of God. They might have that sense of faith in the, in, the, in the sense, not saving faith, but in the sense of knowing that there is indeed a God. And you talk to them about the things of God and they seem to be very sensitive. But you talk to Christians and right away, dig in the heels like Jonah. God gives Jonah a word to say to the Ninevites and Jonah goes the other way to get a boat going to Tarshish to run from the Lord. Disobedience. You know, it's amazing, but uh, it does happen even in the life of the believer. And so in chapter one, we have the running prophet. Chapter two, we have the praying prophet. And here in chapter three, we have the preaching prophet. So Jonah is going to be recommissioned, going back uh, on track, getting back on track and doing what God had told him to do initially. And so it says here in the opening verse, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Same message, same group of people. This is what 
God wanted Jonah to do initially, and he didn't do it. He found that ship going to Tarshish, and you know, disobedience can always, the devil will always find a way for you to help uh, help you in your disobedience. And uh, I'm quite convinced it was the devil who provided that ship that would take him away to Tarshish. But now, after all that experience, here is Jonah back on the same area, the same place that he was before, and he didn't have to go through all those things. Just think about that for a second, with you and with me. Sometimes God has to work in our lives and chast chastise us and discipline us and get us back to where we once were. And that's passage in 1 Peter chapter 1 says it so well. If need be, you are in various trials through manif uh, various, and, and heaviness through manifold trials uh, that you're going through. That your faith might be genuine and might be found in a praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Some of the problems that we go through in our experiences as believers is because we are hardened and stubborn and we want our own way. That's what God had to say about the nation of Israel. They, and to them were committed the covenants and everything else we read in Romans chapter nine to the nation of Israel that had everything going for them. And he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a gainful and gainsaying people, sinful and gainsaying people. And he's talking about the nation of Israel. And so how important it is to have the open heart to receive the things of the Lord. That's what it means to be a mature spiritual Christian. First Corinthians tells us there's three types of people out in the world. Or three types of people just in general. There is the unsaved person who uh, is called the natural man in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. They receive not the things of the spirit. You're talking about spiritual things, and it goes right over their head. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 11, those verses tell us very clearly. The natural man receives not the things of the spirit. And when Paul launches into that description, he says, I has not seen, neither has ear heard, or entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. He's not talking about Christians. Most Christians interpret that verse as if it's referring to them. God is very clear. In the very next verse, he says, but God has revealed them to us. So the natural man doesn't understand spiritual truth because they don't have the spirit of God working in them, in their hearts. But believers do. If they're yielded to the Lord, and yet the next person that Paul refers to is the carnal believer. The believer that is a true believer, they've trusted Christ as Savior, but they're living their life like the natural person. They're living their lives like the man on the street, arguing their way or uh, pushing their way through life and not really applying scripture and asking for God's help to lead them along the way, unless they get in trouble, unless there's some big issue or crisis that comes in their lives, then they call upon the Lord. But for the most part, they're just living life like the actual person out there in life. And God calls them in his word, the carnal believer. Don't be a carnal believer. Be a spiritually minded believer where you're reading the word of God and applying the scripture to your experience. That's what God wants for each one of us. Encouraging each other to grow in the things of Christ. And as Peter tells us in his first epistle, chapter three, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next epistle, chapter two, verse one, be diligent to make your calling and election sure and adding to your faith these things, virtue, and all the characteristics that are listed there, ending in love. That's the path for the Christian. And the only way that comes about is committing things to the Lord in prayer, reading his word, asking the Lord to come and show you, guide you through the path of life. So that when you get to the end of your life, whenever that is, you can say, Jesus led me all the way. And say it with real conviction and real confidence, not just singing the hymn, but really meaning it in your life. And so here Jonah had to go through all that experience, even though he had a tremendous resume as an early 
uh, as a young man earlier in life. He took a turn to the left and God had to discipline and chastise him and brought him back again. He didn't have to go through that experience of being swallowed by the great fish. He didn't have to get to that point where he's crying out to the Lord inside the belly of the great fish. He didn't need any of that. He brought it upon himself because of his disobedience. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in what? prayer. And so this is the reminder, the lesson that we have from the life of Jonah, the uh, difficult parts that he went through because of his disobedience to the Lord. Well, here we have his recommissioning. So let's take a look at some of the details of this. This is the recommissioning of uh, Jonah. And once again, uh, we read about this in the opening verses here. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now here he is recommissioned, restored. Jonah has come back. All those experiences, all that fright, perhaps, uh, asking the mariners to throw him overboard from the boat. What a, what a, all that experience in chapter one that he went through. And now he's recommissioned and he's back on track. And it's the second time. And notice it says here in verse two, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching I bid thee. It's the same message. There's no change in message. God doesn't say, okay, well, you know, you didn't do so well the first time, so let's make some adjustments here. He doesn't say that. Instead, he gives the same message. And once again, we read that God, not Jonah, but God says, Go to Nineveh, that great city. Why did he call Nineveh a great city? Now, you ask some archaeologists, you ask some person uh, who is familiar with ancient history to say, well, it's because it was so culturally so great, the hanging gardens, you know, that were there in Babylon. Uh, the city itself was well fortified. They had walls that were 100 feet tall, 50 feet wide, chariots that go across the top of it, three side by side. That's a great city, militarily, culturally, everything else. You say, oh, it's a great city for that. That's not the reason why it's called great. It's called great because in chapter four, we're told how many people are there. And we look at the great cities of the world. You think of New York City, you think of Los Angeles, you think of London, you think of uh, Paris, you think of all these so-called great cities in the eyes of man they're great because they're cultural places of influence god looks at them and says there are multitude of souls in those cities that need a relationship with me that's why it's called great and that's why jonah wanted to go or rather god wanted jonah to go to that city Nineveh. in some ways it was the uh, capital city not only of babylon but of the world very renowned city and so god wants his servant to go there and tell the message that he would bid him when i think of the recommissioning of jonah i can't help but think of a couple instances of recommissioning that's an encouragement to you and to me from the pages of scripture the very pages of scripture this is if you have backslid i remember the account of john wesley going into a town where it was a uh, very poverty-stricken town. People didn't really know the Lord at all. And he took that text from Hosea chapter 14. He says, I will love the backslider. I will heal him freely. What a great text to go into a town. Using that uh, into a town that had no uh, money at all and economically distressed. And he says, I'll love you freely. That's the text that John Wesley took, the very text that we see in our Bibles that we hold in our hands. The people would come out and hear that message and come to Christ. And so these examples of scripture are so clear to us. We think of John chapter 21, when Peter, of course, had failed the Lord so miserably at the Pilate's fire uh, outside of uh, the judgment hall at the fire that the soldiers were warming themselves by. And there was Peter warming himself along with those soldiers and denying the Lord. Even a little girl would come up and say, aren't you one of those? No, I'm not. Another guy comes up, aren't you one of those? No, I'm not. 
Three times he denied the Lord. And when the Lord looked at him, and as the Lord was being taken away, you remember the scene there in the gospel accounts, it says that the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus just looked at him. And it says that Peter wept bitterly. His own heart condemned him. And he went out and he cried bitterly because of the failure to the Lord. You know that group that was just here from the Academy of Arts, they had it so well depicted in John Bunyan's classic thing, The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, there's a scene there where he comes to Doubting Castle. And the voice of Apollyon from the book of Revelation, you'll see it referenced, cries out to him and says, you failed your king, you failed your king. And you see Christian there with uh, what they did with lasers, but uh, burning lasers on his heart. You can see his heart being condemned. You can see he just has no energy at all, has no spiritual vitality because these accusations are coming after him, the fiery darts of the wicked one, as we read in Ephesians chapter six, which is what Satan does to render his servants uh, incapacitated because of their own conscience bothering them. That's what happened with Peter. His conscience bothering him, wept bitterly. He was so weak in his conscience that when the Lord said, feed my sheep, he got perturbed with the Lord just probing at his heart. And yet he recommissioned him privately when he appeared to him, 1 Corinthians 15, it pri appeared privately to Cephas, it says. We don't know where or when. That was a private recommissioning. Then there was the public recommissioning in John chapter 21 in front of all the other disciples. Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, take care of my sheep. Take a, a servant of the Lord, the one who said, I'll never deny you, the one who was quick to speak and not really think through matters. And here is Peter getting back on track. So that when he stood at Pentecost before thousands of people, not just a little girl or some guy, or another guy at the fire outside of judgment, Peter's, uh, rather, Pilate's judgment hall. He could stand before a thousand and point the finger to Israel and says, this is what you've done. You've slain the, the Prince of Peace. That's the power that someone has when they know there's forgiving mercy and grace of God. And at this juncture in Jonah's experience, he knows this to be true. Now, he's got some other issues to deal with. And we'll look at that next week in chapter four. But here's the account of a servant of the Lord who disobeyed the Lord. And he gets back on track and he begins to preach. And God says to him, you preach the preaching that I bid thee. Peter, a great example. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 11 is John Mark. A great example. Leaves the mission field. You know, I've heard many accounts of those on the mission field getting into personality conflicts or some other issues and leaving the mission field. And probably felt like I really messed up. And yet the Lord can restore and renew like he did with John Mark. And even David in Psalm 23, verse 3, David said, he restoreth my soul. When did David write that? I'm quite convinced that Psalm 23 was written when David was an older man, not when he was a younger man. Because when he was a younger man, all cylinders were working fine in his life, right? It was only later in his older years, latter years, listen up, especially you older folks here, in your latter years, it's easy to let your guard down. And so David numbered the troops. Now, if you're a younger person there, you say, what does that mean, numbering the troops? Well, all it meant was this. God told David, you don't take a census of your troops and uh, pride yourself in your military strength as if it's you that gets you through the battles. You trust in me. But David disregarded that instruction from the Lord, and he numbered his troops and suffered greatly because of his trust, his misplaced trust in those troops rather than in the living God. And we'll go through life, through the finance issues that we experience in life, marital problems, whatever it may be. You trust in a living God. You call out to the Lord. You don't trust in your own strength and your own wisdom to get you through the problems of life. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a person. He's not a formula. He's not someone far away. He's there, very near to help you in whatever problem you may be going through. 
You call upon the Lord for his help. And he's there and you can call, go to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter four tells you to do that. And so David said, he restores my soul. Committed adultery with Bathsheba. David, the man after God's own heart, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you say that with real, genuine confidence in your heart? David could say that. There's an account in Second Chronicles 18.13. I put these references in here so you can, you know, make note of it. So many times I would come off the platform and say, what is that reference? What is that reference? So I said in these PowerPoints, I put them down there so you can take a note at least. In the days of King, good King Jehoshaphat, he made a sinful alliance with wicked King Ahab. And he listened to King Ahab convince him to go out into the battlefield and join forces with him. He was evil, hated the Lord. And here's a good King Jehoshaphat who had honor and riches in abundance and foolishly compromised his, his uh, time with Ahab and was being coaxed by Ahab, wicked Ahab, to go out into the battlefield. And Ahab was looking for instruction from his prophets, his own false prophets who would rubber stamp anything that he would do. And they said, isn't there one man that we can go to and really find guidance? And he didn't even trust his own wicked uh, false prophets. And I've mentioned this before, but he went to uh, somebody and says, well, there is one man. His name is Micaiah, but I hate him because he always prophesies evil against me. That's the very words of scripture. And in verse 13, when they brought Micaiah in, Micaiah comes and he says, whatever the Lord tells me to say, that's what I'm going to tell you. Now that's a true believer. All by himself, standing alone, in the midst of the king and his nobles and all the false prophets, at least 850 of them all together, but 450 right there, all by himself. He says, whatever God tells me, that's what I'm going to say. And that's what we're reminded of here, right, in this, this opening verse, chapter 3, verse 2. Whatever I say to you, you preach. And that's what Micaiah did. And you can find that in Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 13. And so it's the recommissioning of Jonah. And God says very clearly, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against it. Well, the second thing that we see here in these verses is the repentance of the people. First, the uh, recommissioning of Jonah, and then we see the result of that preaching. And so it says in verse four, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now that's one of the 12 40 day experiences in scripture. Can you name them? I can't either, unless I take some time. <laughs> but there are 12 of these 40 day experiences and 40 is always the number dealing with testing. 40 years in the wilderness, the nation of Israel had it was a time of testing in the wilderness. There are 12 40 day experiences, Elijah and Moses. And here uh, we see with Jonah and 40 days, an extended period of time. We think of a month as 30 days, 40 days is 10 more time, 10 more days past that. It's a time of testing. And Jonah could have gone in and says tomorrow, this time, this whole nation is going to be wiped out. He could have said that and rightly so. But he gave them, God did, gave them 40 days. In the midst of judgment, God still extends mercy. And if you're to take the time and look in James chapter 2, he says mercy triumphs over judgment. He is still a gracious God. Don't forget, these weren't really nice people. These are Assyrians, brutal, known for it in history, for the brutality they were as a nation, things that were unspeakable that they would do with prisoners of war. Very evil. That's a fountainhead of idolatry there in Babylon. And all the wickedness that was part of that city. 
And God wanted to penetrate into that city with his message of saving grace and mercy. And he raised up his servant Jonah to take that message to regions beyond, if you will. And Jonah, because he hated those Assyrians, because he knew how they treated the nation of Israel, was reluctant to do it. He didn't want to see them change. How about if somebody came to your house and robbed you of the contents of your house or did harm to you? And then someone says, you know, you really should love them in the Lord and give them a track. You would probably say, if you're like me, no way. No way for the, what they did to me. That's what Jonah is being presented with right here. Go to Nineveh and preach to those people and change their hearts so that they love me. And Jonah says, no way. And God said, okay, I have to teach you some lessons here. And that's chapter one and chapter two. So now he goes in with this message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Not quite a long message, would you agree? No special music, no drama involved, just a message. 40 days, we would say in our vernacular, and you're toast. <laughs> That's how it was delivered. Because he was preaching the message that God had given to him. And that's what God's people are declared to do. Now, we don't just preach the message of judgment. Romans tells us we preach the goodness of God and the severity of God. You preach the love of Christ, the forgiveness that's offered through faith in him alone. But also, there is judgment. It's not point unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. That's the goodness and the severity of the Lord. Both those things. Years ago, when I was 17 years of age, the brethren at Bethany corralled me and said, hey, come with us to do a jail service. Of course, being a new believer and not knowing any better and being very respectful of my elders, I said, sure, I'll go. And for the first time I was in jail and I knew what it was like when they said, you're going into the slammer because at that point, way back when Ocean County Jail had the bars going across. I've told this story here. The bars going across that made it look like a Western town. When they shut the door, you had the bar, you know, the black iron bars going down. Now it's a real posh hotel <laughs> compared to what it used to look like. I mean, they have TV sets going. We've been in both jails. You know, when they, when they tore the old one down and put the new one up, you'd think it was a resort or something. That's why guys like being in there. I don't know. They get three squares a day and everything else and TV and all the rest. Well, you know, the thing is that we went in there and we preached the gospel. And it was frightening to see. But one time they said, okay, Mark, you have the first message. And this other guy by the name of Gene, he had the second message. So I preached and I'm looking at these guys. Now, I was 17 years of age. Some of these guys came in there and I've, as, as I've said before, their biceps were bigger than my legs and it's intimidating. And they came walking in as a crowd and I'm just this little tiny guy here preaching the gospel, but I wanted to do it with what the Lord gave me to, to, to had me to say. So I preached with all my heart, the love of God. I think that's going to change them. You know, some of them, that may be what they needed to hear. Some might have heard that message before. It didn't really bother their conscience. But I preached the love of God as hard as I could for 15 minutes. The next fellow that preached, Gene Carbone was his name. He gets up there. You know what he pre preached on? The judgment of God. And he preached it with all his heart. He was a gambler and who had come to know Christ the Savior heavy drinker, smoker, and everything else. That was his background. Mine, I had none of that. But together, the compilation of the message was the goodness of God and the severity of God, the love of God, the judgment of God. And that's what people need to hear. And so even though the message here sounds very harsh, 
40 days and Nineveh will be open, overthrown, it was still 40 days. Space enough for them to repent. Revelation 2, 21 reminds us of that principle. Space to repent. And so we are told to be the pillar and the ground of truth, 1 Timothy 3, 15. We're told to hold forth the word of life. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. And that we turn from our wicked ways, that's 26, Acts 26, 20. And because that was so clearly preached and proclaimed by Jonah, it changed the heart of the people to repent. Now, what were some of the factors maybe that went into that? Can you imagine Jonah who had been in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights? What would have he looked like or smelled like or looked like? It's not like he went to the nearest beauty salon and fixed his hair up. Probably bleached from the acids from the fish. You know, you don't have to have a three piece suit and be on television to have a great crowd. That does happen that way. But, uh, you know, John the Baptist, Elijah the prophet, they came in coarse clothing. They didn't care about their appearance. And they came and they had powerful ministries, perhaps more powerful than the other prophet. And so Jonah just simply had this message. His appearance was anything to brag about. He goes in there and maybe that had an effect on the people receiving the message. Maybe it was because, according to the Ryrie Study Bible, it says that the nation of Babylon had experienced two famines in the time that Jonah was there, just before he was there. There was a famine, a COVID-19, if you will, and five years later, there was another famine. And that might have softened the heart of the people nationally. There is also on record that there is a solar eclipse that occurred that made people wonder or maybe even panic. That might have been used of the Lord to prepare the hearts of the people to receive the message that Jonah brought. And maybe COVID-19 and all the distress that our nation is going through and everything else financially and morally and everything else is what God is using to soften up the hearts of the people so that you and I can bring a message that will be received by those that are part of that society. That's how God works. That's the lessons that we come away with in this portion. And so it's the repentance of the people. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Notice one message, and God's spirit worked whether it was the least of them or the greatest of them. So we got our audience right here this morning. And everybody's got different things going on in their lives. Everybody comes from a different background. And so how in the world can the preacher get up here and say, I'm going to try to address your need? and your need, and your need, and your need, all of our needs? The answer is you can't, but the Spirit of God can. He can take that verse and the first part of the verse, uh, hit somebody over here with the first part of the verse, and somebody else over here with the second part of the verse, and someone over here with the third part of the verse. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so the simple message was proclaimed, and people were affected by that message. Finally, in these last two verses, verses 9 and 10, we have the relenting of God, or the reversal, if you will. God says, I'm going to overthrow this nation. I'm going to destroy this nation in 40 days. But the people repented. And so in the King James Version, God repented or relented. He pulled back his judgment. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger and we perish not? So God saw their works, verse 10, that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Can you turn or change the heart of God or the actions, the hand of God? And from these verses, it seems that you can. If you couldn't, why are you praying? When you have a bad health diagnosis or you have some situation, why do you pray? If you're going to adopt the fatalistic position and say, well, God will do whatever he wants to do and I can't do anything, you'll give up on prayer. But if you know that God is listening to the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James 5 tells us, 
If you know that's the case, then you will pray and ask God to move. That's the whole purpose for prayer. And here the people repented and God changed his course of action. Now he already knew that in advance. And so it all comes together in this sovereignty and wisdom of God cause you to think through it. So when you have some of these questions, whoever are gonna be involved in this question period, that's one of those questions that come up. You have to reconcile all this with the sovereignty of God. But regardless, the word of God here says, God saw their works. He saw what they were doing and they turned from their evil way, which is what God was after all along with Jonah preaching that message. So Isaiah chapter 55, verses six and seven says, seek you the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him turn to his God and he will abundantly pardon. You turn from your wicked way. And that's what God was saying. In Micah chapter six and verse eight, what is it that God requires of man, but to do justly and to walk humbly with thy God. So he wanted to do that. He wants them to do it. He wants all people to do that. So if you're here this morning and you have not bowed the knee to Christ, asking him to be your savior, I would implore you to do it today. You've heard the message. You're without excuse today. But if you've done that, now the question to ask is, are you like Jonah? Are there strongholds in your life, in the corners of your heart that you have not really turned over to the Lord? Is there something that you need to do and say, Lord, I need to bring this thing out on the table and have you deal with it because it's becoming a source of problem with me and my guidance, my direction, and my love for you. If I'm being stubborn and hard hearted and Jonah was that way and he had overcome that, that was phase one, but now there's phase two and we'll see that next week in chapter four. So we'll read that in advance to be prepared for that as we study how Jonah has to work through some even deeper attitudes in his heart and life about his service for God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you again for these powerful lessons that come to us from this book, the book of Jonah. We pray, Father, indeed, that you would speak to our hearts about these important lessons, that you deal with the self in us, that we might be doing those things that indeed are pleasing in your sight. And so we ask for your help and your guidance, Lord. Help us to learn these lessons and apply them personally in our walk with you. We ask these things giving thanks in our Savior's name. Amen.